Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you this morning? Uh, doing quite well, thank you. Dr. Robert Murphy is the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, and public health questions each week here on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines, answering a viewer-submitted question, and addressing our lone U.S. COVID statistic through today, July 18th. We invite you to submit any questions, comments, or suggested topics down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with our abbreviated COVID statistic, average COVID deaths per day in the past week were 37 daily, and in the same week in 2023, we saw 77. Your reaction to those numbers, Dr. Murphy? Well, nothing's really changing over the last uh, many weeks. Uh, the numbers are pretty solid in this 25 to 40 range. That's deaths per day. So, of course, that translates to, in the case of 37 per day, 13,505 per year, which is about half of what it was a year ago. So, in the as far as the whole pandemic is going, that's that's good news, but it's still bad news. I mean, that we still have 13,000 deaths per year from this. These are deaths that would not otherwise be happening. This is like a new cause of death. So anyway, we're we're stuck at this level right now. And considering that we're having an increase in cases um, um, all over the place, uh, just regular cases, um, you know, we'll see how this all uh, plays out. And the uh, CDC has been reporting um, in the, the way they measure now. It's not a reportable disease any, any longer, but there's ways they can, there's groups they can look at that have good data. And, uh, you know, they're showing that um, at the last week of June, there was an 18.2% increase. Hospitalization day, data that they follow in some Sentinel hospitals, 13.3% increase in COVID admissions. Um, and uh, self-testing, not as well followed, but up 11%. So people are going and getting tested. We have no idea what happens to those people. Um, it would be nice to know how much Paxlovid has been going out the door at the pharmacies, but we don't know that either, although Pfizer knows. But uh, um, I don't know if someone's going to have to ask them to share that data. Uh, I'm sure they'll share it with their stockholders because Paxlovid is quite expensive. Um it's still all the same type of virus that's been floating around. The KP3 makes up 36.9%, which is the biggest chunk. The rest are other Omicron variants uh, from the FLIRT family for the most part. So it's uh, going along. We're having this summer bump, much less than last year, which of course was much less than the year before. So it's the the herd immunity of the, of the country, the people in the country and the world, you know, a lot of people have been sick, so they have the antibodies. Billions of doses of vaccine have been out, so you even get a, a bigger boost of immunity from those than actually from the disease. So you put it all together, and this is what we got. Mm -hmm. Now, our submitted question from this week came from a viewer who was observing some video or an article from a German virologist named Chris, Dr. Christian Drosten. I hope I pronounced that correctly, and was looking into research on body temperature and COVID replication and how different parts of the body may affect COVID. Can you explain why we look at body temperature when studying COVID? what temperatures COVID can better replicate at, and maybe why? Yeah, so what, this is a great question, a very sophisticated question, and uh, there's a very sophisticated answer. So when you're growing bacteria or viruses or whatever you're growing, you uh, typically, uh, you want to find the uh, point, a temperature point, where the virus really grows the best. So it's not the same for each virus. 
So for SARS-CoV-2, which we're referring to now just as COVID, uh, it seems to replicate um, when the incubator temperature is between 34 and 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, your body is like 38, 39 degrees. So a little bit, a little bit cooler. Well, guess what? That's the temperature in your in your upper respiratory tract, in your nose and the back of your throat. When you get down in the lungs, it gets to be regular body temperature, which is warmer. So that's why most of the infection stays up here. Uh, but if there's enough replication and it does get down there, I mean, it can grow. It's not like it can't grow in the higher temperature, but it's more difficult. So that's why if you're going to treat this thing with Paxlovid, you want to get it early while it's still up in the nasal cavity. If it get, if it sets and and infects the lung, it it's uh, that's going to be harder to treat. Of course, pneumonia is much harder to treat than a, than an upper respiratory tract infection. So it's a it's a very cool little uh, study. Uh, he's a well published. Dr. Drosten is a well published virologist at Berlin Charité uh, Medical School, which is uh, the prominent most prominent medical school in Berlin, and. Um, it's it's a it's a really a great little study. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the COVID virus itself has this ability to change temperature to go in different parts of your body. It reacts oh. differently to the conditions it's in. It reacts differently, and uh, they've compared it to the original SARS virus, which uh, replicates better at a higher temperature. And that's why those people have more pneumonia than upper respiratory. So it all comes into play. Mm -hmm. All these factors. Now, sticking, yes, sticking with COVID and this time on the treatment phase, there was a study published just yesterday afternoon trying to look at COVID as post exposure prophylaxis within a household. Can you tell us about those results? Yeah. So, the New England Journal of Medicine, of course, is the top medical journal in the United States. Um, and Pfizer uh, is the maker of Paxlovid, the combination drug used to actually treat COVID when people that, who are people that are sick you may have heard that President Biden, who got sick with COVID recently on his uh, trip out west, um, uh, was started on Paxlovid pretty much immediately. So it's a drug, treated for five days, um, got a lot of drug-drug interactions, but it works very well. It doesn't matter whether you're vaccinated or not. This doesn't, this is a synthetic molecule, two molecules that um, it doesn't care about your immune system. It's an antiviral drug. So you don't have to be vaccinated. It's going to work. It's going to work if you're vaccinated, no matter what. Anyway, big study, 2,736 adults. Um, and they got either five days of Paxlovid, which is the usual dose, 10 days of Paxlovid, which is a, 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 a double the dose, um, or they got placebo. So these people don't have COVID. You know, they're they're at risk for COVID. Let's let's make that clear. So they're in like a household, like the spouse or the kid or somebody has COVID and they don't want to get COVID. So um they followed those people, and after 14 days. Symptomatic infections were found in 2.6 of those taking the five-day course, 2.4% in those taking the 10-day course, and 3.9% in those who took placebo. Now, that sounds like it's different and that it works. That is not statistically significant. It's, sorry, even though the numbers are going in the right direction, they're just going in the right direction, and that doesn't make, that doesn't cut. Um, they looked at asymptomatic infections, same thing. Um, they had 2% in the 5 and 10 day groups and 3.1% in the placebo group. Sounds like it's good, but again, not statistically significant. So for asymptomatic and symptomatic, doesn't really make any difference. And, um, and it didn't, you know, the high risk uh, for severe disease group also, there was no difference. So this is unfortunate. Um, the, um, with flu, uh, studies have been done showing that Tamiflu given to high-risk people exposed uh, does help prevent. 
but this is not the case with COVID. COVID is a nastier virus. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> and whether you would have to take a one month course, which Paxlovid, it's, you can take it for five days pretty easily, but I don't think people are gonna take it for a month. And I don't think, yeah, I, I think, um, I think it's over in terms of what the, this uh, to prevent or use Paxlovid for prevention. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, if you look at uh, in the hi history of this whole uh, treatment, um, unvaccinated high-risk patients significantly less likely to die or be hospitalized if they took Paxlovid. And that was actually the data that supported the approval in 2023. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the story there. It doesn't work uh, to prevent. Yes. Disease. So, you know, that if question you, yeah. comes up, it, it's come up quite a bit in the past, even, even in our show. You know, should I take backs of it if my husband has it or the wife has it or whatever? Um, no, it's, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. If you have COVID, definitely take the Paxlovid. Right. If you don't, probably not worth it. Yeah, the one thing that a person who's exposed can do is test themselves frequently, even if they have no symptoms. Just get an over-the-counter antigen test and test yourself frequently. As soon as that turns positive, get treated. The higher the risk, the more important that is. Now, sticking with COVID, but before we change subjects, there was new research also from Germany uh, regarding COVID-19 infection during the pandemic and kind of these accelerated progression of other clinical diseases in children specifically. Can you break down that research and what clinical disease are they talking about? Yeah, so this is uh, from the journal JAMA Network Open, JAMA Journal of the Medica American Medical Association, located here in Chicago. Um, and they took a pre-symptomatic, uh, um, mostly is it children, pre-symptomatic people with uh, type one, di for di type one diabetes, the early diabetes, the diabetes of younger people and children. Um, so they follow those kids very closely because a lot of them, of course, most of them convert to diabetes at some particular point. So they, what they found in 509 participants was that um, this type one diabetes progression from pre-symptomatic uh, to the symptomatic was accelerated if people got COVID. So the COVID kind of pushed that disease along faster. So it's just another thing that COVID can do. The COVID pandemic was associated with progression of this clinical disease um, compared to people that didn't get COVID. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very interesting finding and it's an unfortunate finding for people with pre-symptomatic type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, this study was identifying that that issue does indeed exist. Hopefully, subsequent studies will look into those mechanisms of why. Right, and they'll look at their, they, you're gonna, you will hear over the next months and years, uh, stories like this, now that everything is being studied so, so closely. So mm -hmm. we'll see, um, you know, if other diseases are affected this way as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, switching gears to the avian flu, H5N1, there have been a lot of big updates since we talked about this last week. Can you please fill us in on what we've missed since we last reported? Yeah, so the, you know, we had the um, dairy workers uh, reported from several states, and then all of a sudden we got another three cases from Colorado. Um, and, and um, you know, dairy workers it's a summer, it's extremely hot in parts of Colorado, over hundred mm -hmm. degrees in many places. And, you know, they're recommending that the dairy workers wear PPE, you know, this, uh, you know, protective equipment, you know, with the gowns and the masks and stuff at 104 degrees heat, that's gonna be very difficult. Difficult. I mean, it's hard wearing that stuff in an air conditioned hospital, let alone out, mm -hmm. outside. So anyhow, it should be no surprise that uh, uh, this 
happen. Um, in this case, the workers were um, culling infected chickens in a commercial egg facility that was having a known outbreak. Um, so it's not dairy workers, actually. Um, and uh, the workers got symptomatic. Um, they had mild cases. They had conjunctivitis, which is different from what most people, when they get the, the flu. And um, CDC sent in a field team with nine experts, epidemiologists, veterinarians, clinicians. And um, their conclusion is that um, the risk to the public is low. So it's not so far, they want to make sure no human to human transmission has occurred. And so that remains the same. Remember why we're doing this? Because when there have been outbreaks, uh, large outbreaks in human populations, the mortality rate has been up to 50%. So <clears throat> um, just a review, since the onset of um, uh, avian flu, over 99 million birds uh, in the United States, 157 dairy herds in 13 states have been affected. That's a lot. So, it's a big problem and definitely something we don't want to see jumping over into humans more and more. Right, we don't. But they look, it's being looked very closely. As we've talked about, there's been vaccines developed and um, there's a whole stockpile of vaccines. The first groups that are going to be offered these, or some of them are actually already on the market, um, are to dairy workers and people working in situations like this with mm -hmm. the chicken. Now, looking all the way over the pond in the UK, there have been health warnings from their, you know, health officials about the whooping cough, which is something I haven't heard about in a while. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about the situation? So they've had, uh, since uh, this year alone, 7,600 cases of pertussis, which is whooping cough. And uh, there were 2,600 cases in the month of May alone. 53% um, of them were in those ages 15 and up. It, it's usually typically more severe in the really young kids. There's been nine infant deaths reported uh, as part of this whole statistic. So they're wondering like, what's going on here? This is a lot more cases than they usually see. Uh, for one thing, pertussis does go in waves that are approximately five years long, three to five years, um, and a peak uh, is overdue. The last big peak was in 2016. So we're at, you know, eight years now. So we're a little bit overdue uh, for a peak. So that has something to do with it. That means that the population has reduced immunity after uh, uh, many, many years without a big peak. Um, but <clears throat> they're also showing a decline in pertussis vaccine levels in pregnant women. And that has dropped uh, from 72% to 58.9%. So it's always a mixture of things. It's like an airplane crash. No one thing causes the crash. It's always usually, well, it's usually three things. Mm -hmm. Whether uh, equipment malfunction, whatever. So um, this is really what's happening. So, you know, you put it all together and this is what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Is that vaccine commonly offered in the U.S. as well, or just more common overseas? Um, no, 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 no. It it can happen here. <clears throat> Interesting. I feel like that's one we, we don't hear we don't, about a lot. We don't have our national reporting is dependent on the states and the territories, so it depends how much they look. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas in the European countries and most other countries in the world, everything is more centralized. So mm -hmm. we hear it. We hear it differently. This we have a much more challenging system in trying to pick all this stuff up. We have a system, yeah. But it's just not as. I mean, they could the United K, uh, the United Kingdom, and France and Spain. I mean, they they can just look in their database because they are, all the patients are in the data, same database. They can say, oh, we're having an increase in X, Y, or Z. Um, they have the luxury of doing that. We don't. We have multiple databases, plus we're much, much bigger than those countries. You know, we have 330 some million. Those countries are, you know, a fifth or sixth of our size. 
And, um, you know, it's a little more challenging here, but we do have databases we look at. We have the Veterans Database, we have Kaiser Permanente, we have other databases. Some states have very strong databases, but <laughs> for the country uh, as a whole, and we have, but we have a lot of movement in our country and people moving from one place to another uh, is we're a very mobile, mobile society. <laughs> now, Coming back to the U.S. and just a quick snapshot on the measles cases that have happened in the U.S. There was a previous outbreak here in Chicago that has been quelled, luckily, but I understand there's a couple of more cases popping up here and there. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, this year, CDC has confirmed 167 U.S. measles cases so far. Um, and they they're, they they just got two additional reports from Brooklyn and uh, two unvaccinated children in Oregon. So most of the cases in the United States are in these um, people that are un unvaccinated and people, new arrivals to the country. Um, the migrants coming in and in these migrant camps before they can get vaccinated and everything, there has been outbreaks. Those are the ones we talked about in Chicago. Uh, if you look at these 167 cases, about half of them were in those under five, um, and they can get very sick. Measles should not be taken lightly. Um, measles can cause encephalitis, um, and measles can occur at any age, and measles can cause death. Uh, it's not that common, but uh, it's, it's a very, very highly contagious disease. Um, if an adult gets measles, it can you it usually has a very unusual presentation, and and you know and the problem is, if an adult gets measles, shows up in the hospital, and people don't think it's measles, they can expose everybody. It's as contagious as COVID. It's uh maybe more contagious. So it's a, uh, um, it, it, it it's a medical problem that uh, is resolved with simple vaccination. That vaccine has been around forever and uh, it's highly, highly effective. And once you have the two vaccines, it's basically it works for the entire lifetime. If you watching here or a loved one, someone in your family, you think they have measles. So the highest risk is that they haven't had the two measles vaccine shots for whatever reason. Um, don't take them to a clinic or a medical doctor. Call the doctor or the clinic and say, I think this person may have measles and find out what to do. Um, because that's taking them into a crowded waiting room or clinic situation is just going to expose people, more people than necessary. So that's kind of the mm -hmm. take home message. But if someone, if you think they have measles, but they've had both of their measles vaccines, they probably don't have measles. Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Yeah, very interesting stuff there. Now, our final story for today, sticking on the vaccination realm, but moving to another part of the world. There was a second malaria vaccine just launched in the Ivory Coast in a new global milestone. Can you tell us about this vaccine? Yeah, so there's uh, <clears throat> one malaria vaccine out there already uh, by uh, developed by uh, GSK. and um, that's been uh, administered in Cameroon since January of this year. Um, 15 African countries are planning to introduce one of these two vaccines. So this, this new one was developed by the University of Oxford, England, uh, in conjunction with the Serum Institute of India, two very reputable sources for making and, and uh, manufacturing vaccines. Um, these vaccines are not perfect. They're not like measles vaccine, which was over 95% effective, um, but they are associated with the decreased risk in malaria. Um, and in conjunction with other interventions like bed nets, um, treated bed nets helped prevent uh, 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 malaria. Um, it, you know, it just adds to the effectiveness. So why is that important, especially in a place like Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, a half a million children under the age of five, 
die from malaria. All right. Um, every year, that's an enormous amount of mortality. It's just so tragic. So it's these young kids in particular are uh, at most risk. Um, and so this is just another thing we can use, another intervention um, to, uh, to prevent uh, this massive, just horrible um, cause of mortality in children. Um, it's very difficult to compare the vaccines head to head, but it looks like they work about the same. Mm -hmm. And that is very good news. We'll try to keep you all updated on anything else that comes up with and these that's stories. That's a very positive, we know we yes. <laughs> Yes, we've been talking about mosquitoes and mosquito-borne illnesses a lot, and it's nice to have at least one positive note to add into that folder. But right. on that note, Dr. Murphy, thank you very much for your time and expertise, breaking down the research, answering our viewer submitted question, and keeping us all informed. Well, thank you, and have a great weekend. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Ask Dr. Murphy series. We hope to see you again next week. As always, if you have any questions or suggested topics you would like to see Dr. Murphy discuss, please leave them down in the comments section below or any of our social medias linked in the description. Thank you and have a nice weekend.